From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. Nearly one year ago today, on June 24th, 2022, the Supreme Court released the decision in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, a case concerning abortion access in the state of Mississippi. Instead of following decades of precedent set by decisions in other cases involving abortion access that had thus far kept Roe v. Wade intact, five justices broke from precedent, deciding to overturn Roe v. Wade, and with it, the right to a legal abortion. At the Supreme Court today, an historic upheaval. In a sweeping ruling that overturned a half a century of precedence, five justices ended the right of American women to choose abortion under the Constitution. A sweeping, deeply consequential decision from the nation's highest court, ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade, the court taking away a constitutional right that women in America have had for almost 50 years. For 49 years, Roe granted foundational access to abortion allowing people who could become pregnant to choose what's best for them and their families. Since its overturn, we've seen states across the country quickly move to ban abortion, leaving so many without access. In the last year, we have lived the consequences. Losing the right to a legal abortion is calling much of our lives into question, forcing tens of millions of us to contend with a new reality. Hi, my name is Ivy, and I live in Ohio. My name is Shelby. I'm calling from Maine. I live in Arizona. I live near Houston in Texas. I'm here in St. Louis. A few weeks ago, we at the ACLU asked you to share how your life has been impacted by the overturn of Roe and the abortion bans that followed. We received hundreds of submissions from folks all across the country. Your lives have changed in innumerable ways since just this time last year. I moved from Germany to the U.S. in 1991 when I was 21 years old. I was really proud to become an American and I gave up my German citizenship, but I've lived to regret that decision because I am seeing the U.S. and Ohio going regrettably, horribly backwards and the land of the free no longer is. Due to the overturn of Roe, I gave up my practice in Texas. I've been an emergency medicine physician for many years, 30 plus years, and that's the state I no longer practice in by choice. The conditions that the state forces on the physicians to restrict the full delivery of health care to women who have a pregnancy-related condition is unacceptable. The concept is that you need to do no harm, and when the state restricts that type of practice, harm to the patients, the women, may be present, and that harm may be so severe it can lead to death. I have rheumatoid arthritis along with Ehlers-Danlos, and I live in constant threat of my RA drug methotrexate being taken away from me. I really would like to stay healthy. I'm very concerned for the future of this country. Because of Justice Thomas's concurrence stating that Obergefell v. Hodges may need a closer look, which was the decision that allowed us to um, legally marry, my now wife and I became very scared and decided that we were going to forgo a big wedding and marry at the courthouse. I was not expecting the Roe decision to cause so much personal strife along with the anti-abortion ruling. From packing up and moving your family across the country to seeking medical sterilization, abortion bans have forced tough decisions on so many of us. We sat down with four people, Catherine, Vi, Margaret, and Dr. Arnold, to learn more about their experiences living in a post-Roe reality. The conversation about abortion and reproductive freedom often focuses on what legal choices people can make if they get pregnant or if they don't want a child. But what about those who are pregnant currently? Catherine is a mom of a three-year-old son living near Houston, Texas. She and her husband are happily expecting another baby boy. But the overturn of Roe has changed the overriding emotions of her pregnancy from excitement and anticipation 
to anxiety and terror. I'm not done growing my family. We still want more kids. I had an early miscarriage at the end of last year, and that was scary because it was over the holidays. My doctor wasn't there. Like I was more worried it was an ectopic pregnancy, and I was going to have to deal with that. Then I was sad about having a miscarriage, which was like a weird thing to deal with. So we're like, okay, well, we'll give it one more try. <laughs> and found out I was pregnant. And it was, I mean, we were really excited because it had been almost two years of wanting to have another baby and not being able to. And then the nightmares set in. Basically, from the time I found out I was pregnant at like three weeks, my doctor won't see you until seven weeks. If you feel comfortable sharing, what were the dreams like? Initially, it was every single night I was having dreams that we went in to have the scan done and something had happened to the baby. And they ran from like horrifying outcomes um, to like comical where I had a dream one night that I was having sex tuplets spontaneously. And I was like convinced I was going to have six babies because my doctor was like, well, you live in Texas, so now you have to have them. Um, and oh. I was like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> I can't have six babies. Um, and my husband was like, you haven't had the scan. You're not having six babies. That didn't happen. But I would just, it was just constant. Like I would just wake up convinced that something had happened. Um, after the scan, the dreams like changed. <laughs> Mm. And turned into these like post-apocalyptic nightmares. And the way, I t the way I described it to my doctor, I said, I don't watch scary movies. I don't consume scary media. My dreams are worse than anything I would ever consent to viewing or doing in my real life. Yeah. Like it was just this constant terror, terrifying things happening and just not being able to stop them. Has any of the fear been along the lines of worrying for your own safety in your own life in the midst of pregnancy? It is. I have to have a repeat C-section. I cannot have a natural birth. You know, I'm worried about what happens to me. Um, you know, I have a three-year-old son. He needs his mom. I need to be able to be there for him. The restrictive legal environment in Texas is casting a grim shadow over Catherine's pregnancy. But... That isn't enough to make her leave the place she calls home. I love Texas. I grew up here. I've lived out of state. I've lived other places. And I came back for a reason. And I think a lot of Texans feel that way about being in Texas. Like, we love Texas for a lot of reasons, politics aside. My friends are here. My family is here. My husband's job is in the oil and gas industry. Like, so, yes, could we go move somewhere else? Sure. But this is where our life is. And I believe Texas can be better. <laughs> I hope it can be better. I feel like people who can leave, who need to leave, should leave and do what they need to do for their family. But if we all leave, then like that doesn't help <laughs> who gets left behind. The thing about Texas is the state is huge. It's difficult to organize things here because the capital is, you know, a four hour drive away. And I think when you have a group of women and a lot of us are moms, it's just difficult to kind of show up like that. But I show up online, I show up on social media, trying to just share my experience and talk about it and maybe change some minds on the way. I mean, I think that that's a huge part of it, right? Having conversations even one to one with folks that are in your community, you know, no need to make it to the capital, just talk to the folks around you and in, in your community, because that is where change happens. And I think especially with reproductive access, we know that it doesn't actually have to be a political issue. Well, and yeah, living in Texas, like I have plenty of friends that are on the opposite side politically. And for the most part, we have decent conversations about it and people are open to things, you know, I don't think it has to be a political thing, but I feel like it's turned into that. What do you want people who are listening to this, what do you want them to know about what you've been going through? This is a wanted pregnancy. We tried for a very long time. It is a much wanted, much desired pregnancy. Um, and this is still something that affects me. I don't think there's anything wrong with I got pregnant and I don't want to be pregnant because my first pregnancy, I was like, okay, I get it. This is not easy. This shouldn't have to be something for everybody. Like 
my first pregnancy was extremely difficult. But I think there's this idea that it's abortion is just about, I don't want a kid. And it's more than that. And I think that it's important to, like for people to understand that it's affecting people who, you know, want a child. And I think that's the piece people are missing, honestly. Up Northwest from Texas lives Vi, an Oregon native who works in IT. Unlike Catherine, pregnancy is the last thing they want for themselves. What do you fear about being pregnant? And what do you imagine would be that situation for you? Oh, jeez. I mean, just the body horror of having had an active uterus, it's not a thing that I want to do. The terror of the one time that I had a pregnancy scare, it, I, I mean, it's, uh, I probably would not have survived if I'd ever gotten pregnant. It or I would have completely broken and fully dissociated and no longer been myself. More power to folks who want to settle down and have kids. It's just not in the cards for me. For Vi, the end of Roe was a warning sign. They're worried about what will be taken away next, like their access to gender-affirming care as a trans and agender person. So they swiftly pursued surgery, both to prevent pregnancy and to affirm their gender expression. Oh, it completely upended everything. Um, I'm a gender and was assigned female at birth and have, well, at the time had all the king caboodle that came with being assigned female at birth. I had to completely change over my plans because I absolutely do not want to be in a position where I would have been forced to carry a pregnancy to term. So I had to drop my plans for getting top surgery first so that I'd have less gender dysphoria in my body and work on getting a complete hysterectomy. I got my hysterectomy in November, um, which on the bright side, had fixed a whole bunch of gender dysphoria I didn't realize was there. And I wish I could have done it sooner, but I mean, we didn't have the language around being non-binary, being trans, being a gender when I was a kid. I've known since I was five that I wasn't a boy or a girl and didn't have the words to say what I was and just felt like an alien trapped on this planet. So it's been incredibly hard. The anxiety is, I think, very present for so many people for so many different reasons. Why was it so important for you to have that procedure in particular? I had it all taken. So I no longer have a uterus. I no longer have fallopian tubes. I no longer have ovaries. I don't even have a cervix at this point, which... <laughs> I just take it all out. I don't want to risk it. I can't get pregnant anymore. There's no longer a risk of that. The last six months have been the best six months of my life because I no longer have a uterus and ovaries and all of those associated bits. I think for some folks, right, who might be listening, who hear your story by, and they might think, well, how does Roe being overturned impact things like gender affirming care? And what would you say to those folks who may not understand the connection between the two that, that we're making here? So with the information that came out of Dobbs, with explicit calls to once we do this, we can go through and potentially take away people's right to birth control. We can potentially take away people's right to having queer marriage. We can potentially take away the right of being able to have interracial marriage. It's the first domino in a long, long series of slowly stripping away people's rights. In the Dobbs decision, Justice Clarence Thomas wrote that other legal precedents that used the same legal grounding that Roe used, like that of Obergefell versus Hodges that gave us gay marriage, and Griswold versus Connecticut that gave us access to birth control, should also be reconsidered by the Supreme Court, implying that those rights too could be overturned. That rhetoric has pushed many people to pursue medical procedures to prevent pregnancy post-Roe. Alongside the overturn of Roe, we're also seeing a broader attack on our bodily autonomy. Many of the same states banning abortion are also levying bans on gender-affirming care for trans people. These attacks are all connected. Now, in Oregon specifically, where Vi lives, the Senate is at an impasse due to boycotts from the Republican lawmakers. The catalyst of these boycotts is a contested bill called HB 2002, 
which would further protect and expand access to both gender affirming care and abortions. I asked Vi about that political tension. So we can't get enough bodies physically present in the Capitol to have a vote with quorum. And I'm sitting here watching us going, what's going to happen to my rights? Like, should I take time off work and go pick it at the Capitol and be like, my rights are valid, but it won't change anything because those senators are just like, no, we're not going to go to work. We're not going to work on things. We don't like the new person who's in charge. And it's like, none of the rest of us get to do that. We don't just get to bail on work. And good on you for for paying attention to your state government. We talk often on this podcast about reminding folks to really pay attention to what's going on in their state legislatures and houses, because there's often at times a lot of precarious things happening there. It's really important that people are aware of what's going on in order to respond appropriately, especially come time for election season, but also in the interim. I can't spend as much money as a lobbyist, but I can take, you know, 20, 30 minutes, write a resist bot letter, get it to my Congress critters and get stuff going as best as I can. Vi's journey with gender affirming care and fight for their rights continues. As they look toward the future, they hope for brighter days ahead for themselves and for others like them. I want the kids who are growing up right now to not have to go through what I went through and grow up in the wrong body and then have to constantly fight to try and get to where they wanted to be and deal with all of... It wasn't easy making it here. I'll be very surprised when I make it through top surgery and I'm going to go to Hawaii and walk around in board shorts as soon as I'm healed up from that. That sounds like a beautiful plan. The overturn of Roe has sown confusion in some of the most challenging aspects of life, parenting, our health, and sex and relationships. Margaret, a romance writer from St. Louis, Missouri, told us about how her dating life has changed in a state where abortion is banned. You know, for for me at this point, it's going to have to be someone really special for me to allow them into my life in that way. There's not going to be the casual hookups or anything like that. That is, for me, that is completely over. You know, it makes me take a step back from even wanting to date, to be to be perfectly honest. It, it makes me not even want to go there because on the off chance that something could happen. Do you think it's had an impact on the relationships that you're able to access? Does it feel like it's become another burden or are the people that you interact with receptive or understanding of the caution that you're using when it's coming to to dating? It has made it a much trickier minefield, I would say, with a lot, I don't want to say with many of the individuals that I've interacted with as far as dating and stuff like that, who are now taking very much the conservative stance of well, you know, oh, so you just want to, you know, kill babies. No, I want to own my own uterus. That's what I want. Uh, so it's it's definitely made it, it's made relationships end very quickly, I should say, uh, because I'm not willing to go to certain lengths as I'm wanting to get to know them better. And they just want to jump right, you know, go from A to Z instead of go all the way you know, take take the time to actually get to know each other and develop a relationship. I'm really sorry to hear that. That sounds really difficult to navigate, um, especially in a dating context that already feels really difficult and vulnerable. Yeah. Oh, dating's already hard enough as it is. <laughs> exactly. Having sex with any partner feels like a high stakes endeavor for Margaret who both lives in a state that has dramatically limited her reproductive options and lives with a condition that makes it dangerous to her health to be pregnant. I'm someone who it's not that I can't get pregnant. It's that I shouldn't because my body and stuff like that, that for me, if I were to get pregnant, it would be fatal both to the embryo and to me. So For me, it really puts up a border of, well, do I want to die? 
because the, the problem with the law being repealed is doctors could second guess whether to go and do the procedure that's needed to save my life. And that creates a barrier, I think. For me, it puts up a wall of not wanting to have people get close in that manner. It's like, I like being here. And it's just, it's made it so that I, you know, tend to pull back a little bit more and not have that that connection with other people. As a romance author, you write a lot about sex, dating, and relationships explicitly in your day job. I wonder if your personal experience since the fall of Roe has changed the stories you're writing and how you're writing them. I try for my own sanity to keep politics out of it as much as possible. I mean, I do have heroines who are very willing to speak up for themselves and they're, they're, they're willing to go toe to toe with the men that they end up meeting and falling in love with. But it's definitely, you know, because I write uh, spicy romance, okay? And which to me is something that is about women's liberation, okay? The, the, the right to go and enjoy pleasure, right? Right. And pleasure as you deem it, as it works for you, not necessarily for someone else. So it has made me want to almost be a little bit more cautious in how I portray things and how I talk about things and just what I go and say, even just to turn a phrase that could potentially be used used against me in, in some manner when that's not the way I was intending it. But it's, it's definitely made me be more cautious. While sexual liberation and the right to pleasure is codified in Margaret's writing, it still remains to be seen as she traverses her real-life relationships. We've heard a lot about medical care from the perspective of those who solely receive it. But the post row reality also has implications for healthcare providers, like Dr. Kate Arnold. I'm an OBGYN and I lived in Oklahoma for 10 years and then just moved to Washington, D.C. three weeks ago. You were living in Oklahoma and that's because you were working as the director of women's health at a federally qualified health center caring for people from underserved backgrounds. How did the overturn impact your role and what you could do as an OBGYN and in the, in the patients you served in, in your position at the time? You know, it's interesting because I have never provided abortion care in Oklahoma, even before Roe v. Wade was overturned. Abortion care was very, very isolated to abortion clinic. Now that said, I had a very good relationship with those clinics and really respected the care that they provided. So before Roe v. Wade was overturned, um, in my role, I would talk to patients about, hey, here are your options. And, um, you know, tell them what medical abortion was like, what surgical abortion was like, and then tell them the names of clinics that I trusted. I would be able to talk to the clinic and say, hey, you know, here's the patient's resources and really make that kind of as much of a warm handoff as possible. After Roe fell, everything about providing health care felt more precarious to Dr. Arnold. Oklahoma passed a state law allowing for anyone found aiding or abetting an abortion to be subject to a civil lawsuit unless the procedure was done to save a pregnant person's life or the pregnancy was caused by rape or incest. Now, this made it really scary for Dr. Arnold and others like her to provide information about how to access abortion to patients in need. The Oklahoma Supreme Court just struck down this law in late May, but Dr. Arnold says that unfortunately, due to a lot of changing guidance, many medical professionals are operating with the same fear and caution as they did when the law was still in effect. She told us about what it was like to do her job amidst this law. In Oklahoma, the most devastating part to me personally was that they put in the law that it was illegal to be aiding and abetting. All over the internet, you know, you're seeing like ways for patients to access abortion and you're seeing funds to help patients who economically couldn't afford to get to a place for an abortion or to pay for the abortion. And yet this law kept me from sharing any of those resources with my patients. And that was the toughest part. 
And so each clinic and hospital interpreted that law differently. I heard some clinics interpret it as anything you can find on Google you can share with your patients. My organization interpreted it much more conservatively and said that I could talk about the medical counseling. So I could go through here are the risks, benefits, and alternatives of medical and surgical abortion. Here's what recovery is like. Here's what the procedure is like. But I could not give them any resources to figure out where to get one. I couldn't say like, hey, it's legal in Kansas or here's a website to go to. Nothing like that. So that was the toughest part. What was going through your mind in those situations? Like that's such a disempowering position to put you in as someone who has so much knowledge. It was really tough. I was the director of women's health. And so not only did I have to act by that, but I had to tell other people to act by that. And so telling them that and then, you know, then getting the phone calls of, hey, but I have a 15 year old or hey, but I have a rape victim or hey, but I have certain patients that the providers really, really wanted to help and, and didn't know what to do. But it makes you want to say, I'm not supposed to do this, but and then that you could potentially get turned in. And if you get turned in, it's a civil suit. And so then you're you're looking at having to pay your own attorney fees and everything to defend yourself and, you know, wondering what's going to happen to your medical license and all those kinds of things. So that part was really scary. And ultimately, even just for providing birth control, as I mentioned, our clinic never provided abortion care, but just for providing birth control, we got word that there had been threats of violence against our clinics. So all of those things kind of came together. You know, the law that I can't talk to my patients, (laughs) the terrible gun control, and, you know, the real threats of violence for very ways that I had spoken out in relatively very minor ways compared to what I wanted to say. And ultimately, I decided, hey, I either need to stay and be willing to fight. And I did consider that. I actually met with um, Democratic leadership in the House and the Senate and thought about running for local office and really trying to to make a difference. And ultimately, it was the lack of protection and gun control that I decided I couldn't, I couldn't put my family through that and worry about, you know, my clinics or my job or, or anything like that. Um, so ultimately, we decided to leave. I mean, the political climate, as you mentioned before, Roe was overturned in Oklahoma for abortion providers. I know because I did a story on this years and years and years ago. I mean, many clinics only had traveling abortion providers, people yes. who'd come into town specifically for a couple of days and then leave. But it was so dangerous to be living in Oklahoma as an abortion provider because of the threats of violence against them. So everything that you're saying makes a lot of sense based on what I have heard and seen even prior to the overturn um, of Roe. The threat of violence is not an insignificant threat. And I think everyone listening should just know that that's, I, I don't think that that's hyperbolic in any way. No. Dr. Arnold and her wife, both OBGYNs, decided ultimately to uproot their lives and move their family to the East Coast to find safety from threats of violence they received for simply doing their jobs and to live with less concern as a queer family. We were really worried about our kids, even like very seemingly benign things. Like we have six-year-old twins and, you know, they don't know anything about like the threats against LGBTQ people. And so they play with their princesses getting married and just truly worrying like, gosh, what if they go over to the wrong person's house? Or what if they're at school playing and some kid comes home and tells their dad and their dad is pissed or, you know, those kinds of things. Plus the no gun control, it just started feeling really, really unsafe. And so after that, we decided to leave. Mm. We moved with jobs, but without a house. So the job part has been smoother. My wife transitioned really pretty seamlessly from private practice to private practice. I had been director of women's health and couldn't find kind of another job in leadership. So that was a really tough choice for me. I'm working as a laborist, like a hospitalist right now and trying to, trying to kind of get back into leadership. But I had a a lot of things going in Oklahoma. You know, I, I moved there because 
I was, um, you know, a single mom with three kids and I was like, well, my kids will grow up with good manners. So I'll be able to support them and I'll be able to make a difference because there's a, a lot of ways to make a difference there. And all of those things were completely true. And we had a really good, good life there. And it was really, really sad to leave. Dr. Arnold and her family are starting anew in D.C. She joins the many other people who wrote to us about moving in search of a more viable future, and the many medical professionals who are fighting to provide their patients with evidence-based medical care at this time. Thanks so much to Catherine, Dr. Arnold, Margaret, Vi, Dr. Weinberg, Ivy, Shelby, and Rachel for speaking with us. And thanks to you all who submitted a story to us at the ACLU. And finally, thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU. Produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, Vanessa Handy, and Rachel Kennedy. This episode was edited by Carrie Daniels. Lila Sheridan is our intern. Until next week, stay strong. <laughs>